Hello, everybody. This is Ming Chen. Hi, I'm Mike Zapsik from AMC's Comic Book Man. And you're watching AFK, the AFK show, our favorite show on the planet. One of. One of. One of. One of. So you're, you're, you're watching the right show. Keep watching and keep watching. And keep watching. And keep watching. Don't stop. <laughs> bit and then uh, and then you guys can ask questions if you uh, if you have them so uh, just a few bookkeeping notes first thing I almost forgot to mention yesterday is uh, we have a Kickstarter going right now so uh, if you like what you see on the screen here uh, this is really our Kickstarter video <laughs> it's basically saying this is what we're doing help us fund the full-length movie this is a 20-minute short you're about to see uh, and uh, the full-length movie is 90 minutes, uh, and we've been working on it, you know, hard for uh, a while now. And it will uh, the Kickstarter right now is up to $210,000, uh, which is exciting. We need $650,000 uh, to produce the whole film. So we don't expect to get it all in the first Kickstarter, but hopefully we're going to get about half of it, which will allow us to build all the sets and get a sound stage for a year and. Uh, really do a lot of great stuff. Uh-oh. Yes, you don't want me throwing triples at you. <laughs> Turn your phones off. Because I am the guy in the movie theater that when your phone goes off, I turn around and say something to you. So, <laughs> so don't turn off all your phones. Um, and uh, so if you, how many people gave in our first Kickstarter, the Prelude to Axonar Kickstarter? Thank you, thank you. And how many have given in our second Kickstarter already? Yes, thank you again. Um, and the rest of you, I'm sure, will give after your wow by this uh, production. Um, please, afterwards, uh, Kate Vernon, Richard Hatch, J.G. Hertzler, Gary Graham are out here signing autographs. Tony Todd will be leaving, as I said. So please stop by and buy an autograph from them. Um, stop by the Axonar table. We have all sorts of swag there that you can buy. 100% of all the money spent at the Axonar table goes towards the production. Um, so, and Christian Gossett, our director, is here too. Uh, if you're a fan of the Red Star. How many people are a fan of the Red Star graphic novel series? Oh, that, see, Christian, this is why you need to be the graphic novels. No one here in Houston knows about the Red Star. The Red Star is absolutely one of the greatest graphic novels of all time. My good friend Christian Gossett wrote and drew it. It is amazing. It's being reprinted by IDW now. So uh, you all need to go check that out. Uh, Christian will be signing autographs, as I will, for free at, at our booth. So check us out. Uh, Terry, how are we doing? We think we're good? Okay, uh, I'm just, just gonna wait one minute until, uh, who can I get to run out? Uh, I just need to uh, just run out and see if Tony, tell Tony we're about to start. Okay, he really would like to see that. Yeah, I know he wants to see this and he has to see on the big screen, I'm good. You think we should wait for Tony Todd or just? Yeah. Okay, all right, who has a good joke? Just kill some time, no. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, let just give you a little uh, our schedule. Um, how many people go to Dragon Con who are here? Yeah, okay. We're going to be at Dragon Con. There's going to be the East Coast premiere of uh, Prelude to Axonar. We'll be at Dragon Con. And I'll tell you something no one else knows yet. This has not been released on our website yet. But we've just signed another star uh, for Axonar. And Garrett Wang. <laughs> Garrett is going to play a Klingon. So you do not have to see Harry Kim. Uh, but, uh, and this Klingon will be an ensign and will never get promoted. Uh, no, he's playing, uh, he, uh, Gar uh, Garrett and I met in Vegas last week. Um, we, uh, and I tell you what, I'll just tell you until we find out about Tony real quick. Uh, we were at FedCon in Germany where we had the premiere of the trailer and Garrett was there on stage and, uh, I was there with my, uh, uh my girlfriend Diana, who's in the audience, where's Diana? There she is, in the, look in the, in, at the Axonar costume, designed by Christian Gossett. Everyone has seen that? 
and uh, and we, and I saw Garrett on stage, and he has he's so engaging and, and gregarious and outgoing. And I said, God, that's the kind of person we need in Axonar. And I so for the past three months, I've been stalking him relentlessly on Twitter and Facebook and Skype, Twitter, Facebook, Skype, email, and and finally uh, we got we hunted him down at a con a couple of weeks ago, and and uh, our our two staff photographers cornered him and said, you know, hey, Axonar. And he knew about us and he said, yeah, if I can play a Klingon. He says, I w I've always wanted to play a Klingon. So that got back to me. I was like, fine, Klingon, Klingon it is. And uh, we met in Vegas last week and uh, I hadn't seen, he, hadn't even, he hadn't seen the full length prelude that you are all about to see. So I showed it to him on my phone and he was like, oh, this is awesome, I'm in. And we talked about which role he's gonna play and uh, you know, now we just, have to write him into the script. So, uh, but it's very exciting. And that is not the last casting, I will tell you that's not the last exciting casting you will hear uh, over the course of the next uh, many months um, because uh, there are many more roles. We haven't cast, everyone you see in Prelude will be in Axonar. All these characters are part of the, part of the script. Um, and the other, uh, and there are other characters. You haven't seen any of the, Air, the USS Ares crew yet. We're casting all of those characters here in the next couple months. Uh, and so they'll, if, uh, you can always check out our Facebook pages where the news comes out. Of course, if you're a donor, you get all the news in advance and you get all these tasty morsels and video and photos and, and you get to harass Terry. Terry McIntosh, uh, if you're a donor, you know Terry McIntosh dressed as a Jaffa. Terry is uh, one of our producers and our director of marketing. He's in charge of communicating with all the donors on a daily basis, of which he does an amazing job of. And so, uh, and he runs the Axonar Donors Group, which is a special Facebook group. You have got to be a donor uh, in order to get into that. In, into that. So even if you donate, you know, ten bucks, you're in. And uh, we have a lot of great people there. And it's a every day we're talking about Axonar and giving you more information. So. Uh, that's one thing. Okay, I haven't seen Tony yet, so he'll have to catch it at another time. Because I don't think he's here. Is he here? Very good. Lights, camera, action. The first goal was create a class of ship that could spring Starfleet back into action, back into battle. We had to leapfrog. Klingon technology. It was called the Ares class. It was exactly what we needed. We had over a dozen member worlds working on it. It was the first pure warship that Starfleet had ever built. As for Vulcans, though we limited our contribution to propulsion, environmental, and defensive technologies, there were many who wanted us to end our participation in the war altogether. A Vulcan's gonna do what a Vulcan's gonna do. But the Andorians, they were happy to supply us the phasers. Starting 2244.1, near the planet Cygnus III. There will always be detractors who think you're taking the initiative to assume that you're you're rushing the offensive i disagreed the leadership of admiral ramirez is a welcome change but his grand plan has yet to be tested in battle we had the ships and we had a core of battle tested commanders it was time to take the initiative well that was ramirez first roll of the dice and they landed exactly the way we wanted them to, the way we needed them to. The code name was Operation Pegasus. Pegasus was the first test of the Ares class against the ship it was designed to defeat, the D6. The Ares class looked good in simulations, real good. But data can only take you so far. The only true test for a combat vessel is combat. Ships were unexpected. And then there was Garth. <laughs> that mad Isarian son of a bitch. That was his day. 
Chris likes to play down his contribution. Don't you believe it? What he did that day, no captain had ever done. We got lucky. It was Sonia's maneuver that gave me the opening. Sonia pulled a feint to starboard. Garth just went for it. It was like a Klingon maneuver. It was a new ship. They said she was tough. I want to see what she could take. After the Battle of Cygnus III, our ship captain started giving the Federation its due as a worthy adversary. Then for the first time, we took notice of Garth of Izar. By the way, we, uh, the credits are, you know, the credits are really important, and I'll tell you why. Because all of these, almost all of these people worked for free, and they gave their, you know, their, their hearts and their souls to this project. And we have two Academy Award winners here of, of note, Frank Serafine, who was the original sound effects editor on Star Trek The Motion Picture. He was our sound editor. Um, and uh, Kevin Haney, who did Richard Hatch's Klingon makeup, uh, and, uh, was, uh, is another Academy Award winner. Include, and then we also had Brad Look, who did Gary uh, Graham's original makeup on Enterprise, came back and did it. So we had some amazing, amazing people. And I can tell you stories about every one of them. Also, our composer, Alex Bornstein, who did the amazing music in, in this. Uh, he is a young guy, but he will one day, I guarantee you, win an Academy Award. So now I want to introduce to you uh, the cast uh, of Star Trek Axnar, and uh, we're going to start with my good friend, Richard Hatch. <laughs> Girls pay money for that. Um, the wonderful and talented Kate Vernon. She doesn't kiss me. Uh, the, uh, the, the gentleman who has, is tied with Jeffrey Combs for playing the most characters in Star Trek ever, the wonderful John Hertzler. And, uh, and your favorite Vulcan ambassador, uh, Gary Graham. And last but not least, uh, my very, very good friend and our director, Christian Gossett. So, um, does that someone say Kapla? I heard a Kapla. Yeah, we do not fear the Klingon Empire. Um, so, uh, actually, Rob Burnett, who is the writer director of Free Enterprise and has produced all the Star Trek Blu rays, uh, was supposed to be here uh, doing what I'm doing right now. But uh, sadly, he was busy finishing off season seven of the Star Trek Blu rays and could not get away. So, he is an important member of our team because he's our editor and. Uh, and are built in comedy as well. So um, anyway, so uh, Christian uh, was late to the panel yesterday, she flew in late, um, who you know I, I speak uh, or, so uh, uh, well of because of the Red Star. Christian, um, tell us, what was it like to direct this amazing cast? It's, um, wow, what was it like? It was fantastic and phenomenal. And it's fun. It was really, really fun each and every one of them being so different, each and every one of them being uh, so talented, each and every one of them bringing stuff to it that you couldn't possibly have asked for. <clears throat> um, it was like that. <laughs> and then, let me start over there with Gary Graham. Maybe you could pass the, the mic down. 
to, uh, there's a, Kate, you got a mic right there? Okay. You, what was it like being directed by Christian? It was kind of like this and a little like that, and then it was some of that. This, not that, sometimes that. <laughs> he, he, uh, God, I don't know. Uh, Christian, you know, the best thing about a, a good director is when they, uh, they let you do your thing and they stay out of your way. That's what we love to think. Um, and it doesn't always work out that way. But uh, Christian was uh, very much an advocate, an actor's advocate while we're working. He always got the sense that you were supported. And, and he was, wherever you fell, uh, he'd catch you. He's the, he's the safety net underneath the uh, high wire act at the circus. He, he's, the, uh, he's the fuel that, that, that primes, primes the pump and just pulls it out of you. Uh, like a sadistic dentist. <laughs> uh, all without a Novocaine and no, yeah, there you go. So that's my story I'm sticking to. <laughs> oh, where do, uh, do we need drinks again? We, oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah who, was, who was in charge of that yesterday? You got to give him a hand for that. That, that was like amazing. Um, uh, Richard, uh, what was it like to work in Klingon makeup? You have some very interesting thoughts about that. Uh, uh, go ahead, tell well, us. Um, hmm. You hear all the time actors say, you know, that when they when they finally see themselves in the mirror after, you know, at the end of the makeup session, it helps them inhabit the role. Well, so, I, I got uh, that, that's true. But I, I actually there was a movie with. Um, God, who was the guy in Cool and Luke? Paul Newman. No, the other guy. The famous character actor that was in. No, 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 no. The guy that. Strother Martin. Strother Martin. So there was a movie called Psst, about a guy turning into a snake. And had I known, honestly, to, to work with Strother Martin would have been great. Um, but it was going to be like 10 hours in makeup to be able to go through that transition. And I don't know about you, but putting on prosthetics, going through that process is a nightmare for actors, okay? So when they came to me with the Klingon thing, uh, I, first of all, we, most of us or many of us have cl cliche ideas of what a Klingon is, you know? And I, uh, I thought, I, I don't know if this is a right fit for me. But as we began to talk about this, and we went into the Kutsumoto, Last of the Samurai, went into some of these other, you know, ideas and concepts about him. I started to get interested. And I have to tell you, the more I kind of dialogued with these guys and really, and this was an amazing experience to collaborate with these two guys whose vision, the scope of their vision is so absolutely amazing that they pull you into what they're doing. You, it excites you, it challenges you. And it, it makes you want to step into this incredible experience that they're putting together. And I got to tell you, it, it didn't even matter. I wasn't, the minute I kind of got hold of who this guy was, I was really, really uh, excited to play him. And then, uh, and then the makeup experience, I must say, was a hell of a lot less painful than I thought it would be. The, the hardest part was this mold they put on your face and it kind of sits there and gets hot and you can't breathe. And just before I passed out, they took it off. And thank God. It's like having a waffle glued I, to your yeah. face. So, so anyway, all I want to say is, I don't think for any other character would I have put on four hours of makeup. Thanks and, again, Richard. And Thanks it was for extraordinary for me. I love this guy. Karn is such an interesting man. You're the most handsome Klingon. I mean... I got to add to this. Too. Oh, he JG. Is. I mean... <laughs> No, wait, 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 Martok, come back here. No, no, I, I, had, a, I had a thing for you, okay, it's Martok, I did. Seriously, I had fantasies about you every night. Uh, uh, JG's like, four hours of makeup, I did that every day for nine years. Can I tell you, I, I never felt sexy in my life, and I don't know if any other woman ever found me sexy, but I swear to God. Hello. Wearing that, out, no, I'm telling you the truth. Wearing that Klingon outfit 
and walking down that that Hollywood Boulevard. <laughs> That's how you two met. That's anyway, I, I do that every night at 3 o'clock yeah. now. I just put on the outfit and play with myself. It's fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, JG, can, can you commiserate? Oh, or, or the do you, building, man. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to Facebook about that right talking now. talking about an this, this prima donna of a hatch talking about four hours of makeup. I'm just, I'm just, now she's saying, I'm I'm just talking, talking about, about Axanar, of course. Liar. Aren't we all talking about Axanar? <laughs> say ever. Oh. Um, Kate. Yeah. Trouble. I, I don't think he, if you weren't here for this morning for the Battlestar Galactica panel, Kate, I asked one question and Kate took a half hour to, to answer it. And it was a half hour of the most fascinating panel you'll, you'll ever see. So hopefully George is going to make it available on camera. It was really uh, wonderful, uh, her story about how she got into uh, Battlestar Galactica. So, um, Tell us a little bit about your working with Christian as a director and just getting into Axnar because you really, just to tell you a quick story how, if you haven't heard it before, the reason Kate is in Axnar is because a year ago, Christian and I were at WonderCon and we stopped by Richard Hatch's table since Richard and I are friends, we were just bullshitting. And Christian wanders over, right next is, is Kate, and Christian wanders over, and he's chatting with Kate for about 15 minutes while I'm chatting with Richard. And afterwards, I chatted, I know her assistant, and we started, I wandered over, and we start chatting together, and we both left uh, Kate's table, and we look at each other, and, and we're like, we have got to find a role for Kate Vernon in Axanar. It was, and, and she didn't find out about this until literally a year, almost a year later, and when we finally said, hey, Kate, we're, we My ears were up. burning for a year, though. I couldn't figure <laughs> so out why. So Linda told you about us. We met it, and tell and tell us about what your thoughts about when we pitched action art to you. Well, I was in incredibly flattered. No one's um, written a part for me before. And can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, and I was intimidated because I thought, oh my God, a captain. You know. Um, Years and years when, when um, NYPD Blue was on and uh, all these detective shows, I'd go and I'd audition for a policewoman or a detective, and I always thought I had to act really tough and macho like a dude, like a cop or whatever, and I never felt truthful. And I have to say, Mary McDonald was a real inspiration for me because she never put on a tough persona to play a leader. She played herself, and she played a truth. And that was a beautiful lesson for me, Finney, because I never booked any of those NYPD jobs, <laughs> because I tried too hard, and I was working from the outside in, and that never works for me. So, um, uh, being... It for me all the time. It, it was, <laughs> but you're British. <laughs> Are you, you think, I, aren't you? <laughs> He's still mad at me. Um, <laughs> Um, so, being incredibly flattered and uh, really nervous um, and curious, I of course took the meeting and um, just loved these guys. They're very intelligent, they know what they want, and they were very clear at, at about explaining um, what it is they wanted and did their best to make me feel comfortable. And working with Christian was great because he, he just would dial... So I told him, he goes, what's, what's the worst thing a director can do to an actor? And I said, over talk. If you over talk me, I'm going to go blank and it's going to take hours to get me to come back. Because I go. If you're going to yap at me and give me way too much information, then I'm a saturated. I'm just saturated and it's too much information. And it's very hard for me to then lose it, squeeze it all out to get to the essence. So I said to him, just dial me a little bit, just a little bit if you want something, but don't come on heavy handed or you'll lose me. And he did beautiful, just beautiful job. He just dialed me a little this way and a little that way. And it, that allowed me to find it as opposed to instant coffee. And uh, so I, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> but, but Kate, that's also I because, listen, to your credit, that's not, Kate's being too modest. It's like I, it's because she's such an amazing actress 
And, and I'm going to ask to pass the mic to Christian. Christian, tell us about directing Kate. It was so fun. Well, having gotten that note from Kate, <laughs> I got that note from Kate. Look at you. It's true. We did kind of skip John. No, no, we're going back. To All right, we're going back to you, John. We're still on me. Fine. <laughs> this reminds me of how Martok got treated by the Klingon High Council that time. Um, having got that note, it was awesome because I found myself so enamored with each different way Kate would play each line that at one point, not only did I not say much, I was basically just saying, okay, one more time. Okay, again. A little bit different. I don't know. Just say it. You, you just do what you're doing. No. <laughs> it was. It was fun. It was really fun to have Kate Vernon just sitting there being a captain and you want to talk about working from the inside out or the outside in. When actors talk about that, does anybody have any clue what that is? I don't want to tell you stuff you already know. But um, working from the outside in is basically kind of faking it. You're just kind of like, okay, I'm a captain, so I'm, I'm that. It's outside. Inside out is you know what this captain's been through. You have ideas of how they trained. You have these, this deep, rich kind of, it's coming from inside. It's coming from truth. You, you've had experiences in your life, and you're applying those experiences to the way you're saying each line. And it, I can't believe they didn't book you to play more cops. <laughs> more, you know, you know why you're like more like mayor material. You're a commissioner. You're not a detective. You know that's what's great about what I found. You're like more up there, like DA, mayor, yeah. Mayor Vernon. Yeah. Mayor okay. Okay. No. That's, do we, be who wants to talk to J, me to ask JG a question now? Shall we go to JG now? You know, no, no. I, I used to think the world of Christian. <laughs> but it's like that's the, that's the best thing. That's the best comment when they say, you know, you're too good for this role. <laughs> you need something bigger. When we get something bigger, we'll come back to you immediately. I had somebody say to me, you, John, you're like a force of nature. Thank you. <laughs> Never heard from them again. Unfortunately, we don't need a hurricane in this. Uh, uh, yeah, but <laughs> I don't really mean this about Christian Gossett. This gentleman, I, he really sealed the deal. First of all, I've told... Many people already, just in talking at the table and whatnot, that I think that um, Alec has done an amazing thing in getting that, this project to this point. This point is pure professionalism, and it comes from putting a real professional at the top of... Where are you going? I, I finally get to talk. <laughs> and Oh, drinking. Bring me, bring me a scotch, will you? Thing, if you can get back here, or send somebody, send one of your people with a scotch for me. We know who you are, Catherine. Yes. Okay. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Just get out of the rooms. We all take scotches, except Kate. She takes a glass of white wine. No, I'm just going to stick with water. She's so much fun after a glass of white wine. Is the. Yeah. Yeah, she says that, but. Oh, my God. Oh, fine. <laughs> Back to JG. I'm sorry. He's trying to talk. Not only did I have Back somebody to you, leave JG. when I finally get to speak, but we, the, the, con the conversation just d departs. You are on the part about how great, what a great producer I am. Yes. Oh, that's right. <laughs> he, put a, uh, he, he put a real professional in the, in the, at the head of every department. It makes a huge difference. Because the first thing I did was outside of um, Hollywood was a, a fan-based film called Gods and Men. Had a lot of people in it. Had a lot of, you know, uh, Tim Russ and, and uh, Walter Koenig and Nichelle Nichols and a lot of good people. Gary Graham and Garrett Wong. Um, Gary, Gary Graham. Telegram for Gary Graham. Lance Hart. Uh, <laughs> it was that. Well, I don't want to talk about that experience because it doesn't compare with this. That was interesting and fun, but uh, it, it, this is a real Hollywood movie, and it's a, it's a great uh, honor to be part of it. 
and uh, I just want to see it get done. I, we have a, a Kickstarter going, and as you said t this morning, or no, Tony just said it. Uh, Tony taught in his, that the whole world of producing films in Hollywood has changed with crowdfunding for the most part. We can do this, and we can do it professionally. We can do it right. And you are, Alec. It's just amazing. The first great thing you did was get together with this guy. I, I, I think the world of you, uh, before tonight, I thought the world of you, Christian. Uh, he's really something. And I said it yesterday. He comes from the world of visual arts, uh, as he's done on several films with major, major Oscar-winning uh, directors. And he brings a, a visual aspect to his directing, which is phenomenal. But that combined with his appreciation for an actor's art is unique. You never see that. You never find that in a director, and it's, uh, that's a miracle. And these guys are, you know, phenomenal, uh, except for Gary. These guys are, uh, are uh, no, you've done nothing. You've, <laughs> you've done nothing to antagonate me, Gary, and antagonize me, and I'm sorry. Um, it just... You're the furthest target away right now. So these guys can reach me. Well, uh, I want to make sure we get, a, a get all of you uh, to ask questions. So who has a question in the audience for any of these fine cast? Yes, sir. Um, what is a fan film? A fan film is a film made by fans, okay? There are a lot of fans that are making J.J. Abrams Star Trek. A lot of the guys in that production are big fans of Star Trek. Does that mean it's a fan film? No. Well, so what's a fan film? A fan film is typically low budget. It's n not professionals. It doesn't have the, a, a lot, and I'm not speaking ill of it because many of you know I, I, I work uh, as a producer on Star Trek Phase Two, a true fan film, That's, uh, which is a labor of love, right? Um, this isn't a fan film because we have professionals in front and behind of the camera. And everything we do, we try and do and, a, a, at a very professional level. And when you have great actors, if you want to make them happy, you need to have a great director, you need to have great craft services, great makeup, great customers, great, right? So you wind up with a, as I always say, I, and I think I, I told JG this, uh, my dad was a headhunter in New York, and he always said A players hire A players, and B players hire C players. And so my job is to hire six great A players. I think I'm an A player. I hire people that are smarter than me, right? So I got Christian. He was the first guy that was on board on, on this. And then, and every person I hire, whether it's a line producer or a customer or a makeup artist or whoever, I'm going out there and hiring the best I can possibly get. And I'm pretty good at that. And if they're an A player, they go out and hire six A players themselves. So all of a sudden, you got 42 A players making a film, and this is what you get. And it's, it's, you, I, I'm not offended when people say, oh, that's a fan film, fine, whatever. I, I let the fans determine what this is. Personally, I think, and I think most of the people have given money to us now and have seen this, think this is a professional, we call it independent Star Trek filmmaking. That's what we call it. Um, but call it whatever you want. I, I, I think it, the work speaks for itself. I, I'm not offended when people call it whatever. Next, next question. Candy. <laughs> lots and lots of alcohol infused candy. And candy. Yeah. Um, so basically, uh, CBS has guidelines, uh, which they rarely tell you, um, but are generally known in the fan film community. And basically, we are not allowed to charge for this. Um, so we couldn't say, hey, it's $5 to see our movie. 
Um, we can't sell anything with a Star Trek mark on it. So, for example, when you look at our T-shirts, there's nothing on those T-shirts that says Star Trek or would make you think that it, you know, it's a Star Trek T-shirt. Um, so yeah, there are rules, and you just have to know what those rules are. You will see that as we progress, Axonar will be more and more branded Axonar and not Star Trek Axonar because we're building our own brand. Um, there, you know, there's a specific boilerplate that was the last thing you would have seen on the credits if you had seen all the way through uh, that CBS requires. Yeah, it's on every page of our website. You know, this is not a prop, you know, this is not authorized or licensed by CBS, blah, blah, blah. So, so there, there are things you have to do. And most of it is don't try and make any money off of this. Um, so, thanks for the question. Next question. Who are the captains? Is she, you, you're a captain. You're a captain. No, too. I'm an admiral. Oh. <laughs> oh. 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 oh! Wow, that almost turned tragic. You were going to get us drinks? Yes, I am. For. <laughs> Oh, I got his milk. Oh, Alec, you got milk? That's the best I could do. It's not even chocolate I'm so milk. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that is little JG Somebody hates more than spilled scotch. This is how JG made his career, believe me. He has worked his. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> Wait, you moved like a like a like a like a jungle panther. Yes. Okay. <laughs> that was amazing, Sam, because that was going all over me. <laughs> that was, was then JG would have had even more fun, maybe. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I enjoyed the act the action. My, Back to the question. My time in the captain's seat. Um. Um. I find it fascinating. I find it really fascinating. I, I uh, am so curious to explore this part um, and to call the shots and to be fearless and to go where no woman has gone before. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very excited about it. Yeah, and, and Kate's such a, she's so wonderful. I'm gonna do wonderful. it my way. <laughs> I, uh, she saw me yesterday and she said, I, Alec, I need my backstory. Uh, for our captain. I was like, oh, that's, you know, among, one of the million things I need to do uh, is write her backstory. So I started writing it yesterday. Um, I will tell you that when we he talked... hasn't given it to me yet. <laughs> yeah, we haven't, so she can't tell you a lot. Uh, when Christian and I were li uh, seriously talking about um, Kate's character for the first time, I, I, I said, hey, Christian, this needs to be like the badass ass-kicking captain. She's the Patton. You know, she's the one who, you know, she gets in trouble all the time and she's probably not the best, you know, squadron commander, but one woman, one ship, and she's just, and that's why the Klingons call her what they do. They're just pissed at her all the time because she's kicking their ass. So that's, when, as we're writing Axanar, um, and we, the script was finished when we finally put her character in, so we've got to go back, and we've just started putting her character into the script. Um, it's a, I think it's a lot of fun to write because... What, you know, let's face it, the captains in Star Trek, outside of, you know, the, the captain like Kirk, or they really suck. I mean, think of the captains. Harriman, uh, uh, you know, J.G. Uh, Esteban on Star Trek III, uh, um, Styles in Star Trek III, uh, what a dick. I mean, these are not, <laughs> these are not captains that you want to serve on their ship. And the reason was, they always wanted to make James Kirk look so good, so the other half the captains have to look bad. Well, hey, this is the fourth year of the war. Those guys are dead, <laughs> okay? The, the, the Federation Starfleet captains that are remaining are all ass kickers. So as riders, we're riding, whether it's Captain Sonia Alexander or at the time in Axar, it'll be Captain Sam Travis. They are all the ass kickers. So there's no weak links. So that's fun. So now our job, 
Christian in my job is to give unique personalities to each of these captains. You know, and there, listen, there's a reason in Prelude to Axanar why Sam is an admiral and, and, and Sonia is not. Okay? And in a way, it's, it's, Sonia pissed off a lot of people probably on the way up. Um, but she also didn't want the desk job. Exactly. But she also is just like, right? What did James Kirk always say? Don't let them promote, you know, whatever you do, don't let them promote you. And that's, and that's Sonia. She doesn't want to be promoted. She wants to be in charge of her ship until the day they take her out uh, uh, feet first. So, and we had that talk. I was like, wait a minute. Shouldn't Sonia be an admiral? It's been a while since the war. And we don't want to ha say that fed the Federation in the 23rd century still has a glass ceiling for women. Um, but uh, Alex said, no, no, no. She could have been an admiral, but she doesn't want the desk job. She wants to be out there. She still wants to be at the helm of a ship. That's her favorite place to be. So it was a choice of hers. I was cool with that. No, cool and, and you know this is I like that. And this is uh, why Chris and I work great together. Um, it, it really is a wonderful collaboration. Uh, it, it makes it so much fun is that we bounce these things off of each other. And it rarely, I, it, one of us will come up with an idea and run it by the other. And even if it's stepping all over the other guy's toes, you know, Christian can come up, Alec, I want to delete this scene, and here's why. And I'll be like, and even if I wrote that scene, I'll be like. Oh, no, dude, that's cool. I mean, we really respect each other so much that every revision is an escalation, I, I think. Yeah. So does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Great. And listen, you can always, one, you can always bother us at the tables, and two, you can always bother us online. It's not a bother at all. We love talking about this stuff. By the way, I want to just say one thing. I think anybody who steps into the captain's chair has got to be the most challenging thing for any actor to do. Because you don't want to copy somebody. You don't want to mimic somebody. And yet, like Kate mentioned, the expectation of stepping into that position of authority always kind of tends to, you know, beckon you into the cliche. And, and when you step away from that to find that sense of strength, command, call it what you will, and to redefine it, which is what you did, Mary did that, um, I think that that takes courage. And that takes a good director to support you because too many would kind of want to guide you into whatever that we have an idea what that should be. So anyway, I thought you did great. I loved it. And, and Richard tells a story in his acting. I'm one of Richard's acting students. And Richard tells a story in his class when he was on the streets of San Francisco. Go ahead, tell the story about. Oh, really? You, you, what, you mean the one about jumping out of the car and going. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like this? You're kidding. No, no tell okay. that story. Oh, <laughs> well, we, you know, we have, we, 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 are creatures of media. We, we watch TV, we watch all these shows. And here I am now playing a cop, but this where did is, I get my experience? Season three Watching of, cops, right? On TV. Season three of Streets of San Francisco. You exactly. take over for Michael Douglas. So here I am. At Carl the first, Malden. You know? Carl Malden. I was wow. replacing Michael Douglas on the show. And uh, my girlfriend hated me because she was in love with Michael Douglas. Um, <laughs> she did. Um, anyway, it was very in intimidating kind of getting into the show because you know, this was a finding chemistry that works, as you know. You can put all the best actors together and there's no chemistry and it doesn't work. Um, and so they had a great chemistry. It really, really worked. Um, Carl loved Michael. They were close family. So I'm stepping into this position, right, and trying to reestablish that chemistry. And the first shot, honestly, they, they had me coming down an alley, jumping out of a car. And <laughs> oh, this is horrible. I jump out of the car. And uh, I forget to take my gun out. I take my hand out like this and go, <laughs> <laughs> like this. And uh, the director says, Richard, come over here. Let me have a little talk with you. <laughs> and he, goes, he, goes, he goes, first of all, he said, uh, you are a cop. Play the human being. Which meant, right, step out of the cliche. And we all can't help it. We grow up with that. So. I think the captain's chair has got to be the hardest thing because there's so much expectation about what that should be. And you really do have to find your own path, your own way into that character. So anyway. Can, can I just say something? Of course. Um, I, I, that, Richard, you have progressed mightily since firing with your index finger. Oh, <laughs> Because what he was saying about Klingons, everybody who auditions for a Klingon 
has, a, has the thought that says, okay, I'm not going to be loud, aggressive, overbearing, uh, obnoxious, fierce. I'm not going to do all that. I'm going to do something that's more cerebral, more thoughtful, more uh, humanly approachable, uh, just to give it a, a twist. And we all got the same thing from the people that we are auditioning for. They were saying, thank you, John. Do you know what a Klingon is? You know, so then we go for all the other stuff and it says, that's good. Um, you scared us, that's good. What Richard was able to do with this, and you saw it, was that he was able to maintain reality of a, an accessible being, sentient being, that was frightening at the same time and was quiet. And as he marched down that hall, I don't think we only saw him, we didn't, we only saw him in silhouette marching down that hallway, just about. I can't remember, Mr. Director, but I think there's, there's a moment. But then when you see his face, he barely has any, you know, I don't want to hear him bitching about four hours in the makeup chair, that just is not the case. Just a couple of ridges and a nose action, no. Uh, <laughs> But, but, he made it work as well as, and better in most cases than whom I thought was the best one so far was Christopher Plummer. Um, you know, and, and when I saw him do it, I said, how did he do that, that bastard? He did it. And uh, I just thought the world of his performance as a Klingon, and I'm talking as one that, you know, has played it for years, I still don't want to hear him bitch about the four hours of makeup because that's just... <laughs> Makeup, hug it out, boys. It's true. I mean, I mean it. Next question, young lady up front here. Congratulations! Wow. Okay, so did everyone hear that question in the back? Okay, so the question was, uh, she, she, she wants to know what we take from Star Trek to build this film. What, what, for starting, because she's starting to watch Star Trek from the beginning, what are the things uh, th that we take from it? Uh, do you mean as the filmmakers or each individual cast member or? You go back to the original creator. You go back to Gene Roddenberry, who was a combat pilot in World War II, who flew a B-17, who lost friends, great guys, who'd come out of places like this, not far from here and all over the country, to throw themselves into these vehicles that had never been made in human history and ascend to heights never ascended to in human history and cause devastation Un, that, that they had to live with for the rest of their lives and for a good cause, for a damn good cause. And you go to him and you find out about him and you see what parts of him are in that show and they are all over the original series especially. And once you do that, you begin to see what Star Trek really is. And it's about a man who survived that and saw the possibility, saw the best and the worst of what a human being can be. And that's what Star Trek's about, ascending beyond any limitation that humankind thinks it needs to hold on to for whatever reason, getting past that and, and getting to that world where it really is all of us living uh, together in, a, in, a, in an amazingly way, finding that way that seems so impossible to us at times. Gene saw it, and he made it Star Trek. And, I, and I'll tell you... And I'll just tell you that um, I am the big, if, uh, between the two of us, I'm the big Star Trek geek. He's, I, he's much more a Star Trek fan than he, as the, the big geek. Um, but it was really good because the thing that Christian, um, as he started to get into it, and about three years ago when we, I first pitched him this, he started watching TOS more and he went through everything and he started. And, um, but the great thing is that uh, he's, it's it's true what he says. He's speaking the truth because in this in Ramirez's speech, which is all Christian, Christian wrote Ramirez's speech, and in that speech, what is Ramirez saying? 
he says, you know, it cannot be a victory if we give up the dream of what is the Federation. And that's all Gene Roddenberry. What is the Federation is Gene Roddenberry. And Christian latched onto that and, and, and said, hey, it, the, the, here's the, head, the new head of Starfleet who's not all about, we're going to go kick their ass. He's about, we cannot lose what it means to be the Federation because that will be no victory. And so that's to his kudos. And it's, that's to Gene's, uh, to Gene's credit because obviously Gene, that Star Trek speaks truth, truth to us if that's what Christian gets out of it, the same as everyone else. Yeah, um, there's a lot of great Gene Roddenberry quotes online, and he's the guy to go to. You'll love Star Trek if you read about Gene Roddenberry. That is a great, I, I'm glad you point that out. That is the best, Gary's best line, the whole thing. He just, yeah, and it he was a, was a, it was a mystery. Very much a key oh. It was very much a key to uh, uh, my handle on Saval, as opposed to your garden variety uh, uh, Vulcan. Uh, it was uh, it was when I raised my voice to make a point, and and, uh, and Archer called me on it. You have been on, on Earth too long, so I thought that was a that was a good, interesting uh, key. You know, Vulcans. Uh, whereas I thought they would be the easiest thing to play, it turned out to be the hardest role in my life. And I'm not just saying that gratuitously in front of a bunch of Star Trek uh, fans. I, I really meant it. It was the hardest thing, and it was the biggest surprise of my career, that that was so difficult to, to create the reality and the passions and the, the fire underneath, you know, create the steam and the, and the pressure, not play the pot, not play the lid of the, of, of the, the pot bubbling, and, 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 but play the steam. That was the challenge, and then and keep it well capped. And if it if it bubbled over a little bit, then I was succumbing to Earth Earthman ways. Uh, but yeah, that was the great challenge. Thanks. Yeah. It, it informs it informs why Leonard Nimoy was so amazing with Spock. Uh, yeah, yeah. Leonard Nimoy really set that standard in that it's not that they're emotionless. It's they've got it all. And it's just simmering below the top, which Gary just, uh, this is why I, I, I hunted Gary down <laughs> and wanted him to be in, because he's, he is so amazing in, in, in Enterprise. He's one of the best performances in that. The uh, restraining order is lifted, so it's, <laughs> we, can hang out, we can hang out together. Okay. Great. And your question, you had a question too. Um, well. It's a very good question. First of all, um, if you can tell your friends and family uh, that there is a Star Trek production that needs their support to exist, that would be the number one thing, really. We are, um, I'm sorry to be the, the PBS guy, but we need your money <laughs> to keep going. <laughs> we really do. These are amazing people, and there are all kinds of amazing people. There's a small army of amazing people that, that are following Alec, uh, and I'm one of them, and we're having a great time, and we really do need, every little bit helps. Okay, so uh, this is available. Right now it's available on our Kickstarter page, so you can go to our Kickstarter page and watch it. Um, after that, it'll be on YouTube, and if you want an HD download of it, then you become a donor. And uh, we, you know, there's certain things on our Kickstarter. You'll see there's, you can donate $10, you can donate $10,000, and there's <clears throat> what they call perks in between for every, you know, for everything. One of them is, an, I, I think at $20, you get the HD download, so you'll be able to download it and have it on your computer forever. So, uh, yeah, strictly online. Uh, also, and then if you donate, uh, I think it's $65, you get the DVD. $75, you get the Blu-ray, which Rob Burnett is producing the Blu-ray. It'll have all sorts of special features on it, behind the scenes, the gag reel, the, you know, the whole not, the special commentaries. It'll be produced just like a real, uh, real Blu-ray. We'll make sure that it justifies the cost, for sure. Absolutely. Catherine? Uh, the rights. <laughs> <laughs> we can't make money on it. The rights. Yeah. We, we don't have the rights. Yeah. Nobody, nobody here would be involved in this production, number one. Number two, Paramount, just like Universal and everybody else that owns a license, right? Um, they have their own plans. You know, if you came to it, they'd probably take your idea and take whatever they like in it, change it, evolve it, and then cast all the people they want to cast in it. I think what's unique about this whole thing, again, we're redefining how this business can work. And where the gatekeepers of old 
made the decisions about what got through the pipeline, where many of your favorite shows got taken off the air way before their time because somebody in a boardroom didn't like it, was tired of it, wanted something else, didn't understand sci-fi, which normally they do not, okay? Now it's being put back in the hands of people with this new business model where fans can support this kind of programming. And, you know, it will evolve from these shows that we already know and love, like Star Trek, Battlestar, whatever, to new shows, new sci-fi, new shows that, that will be written and supported by all of us. So this is the first step towards that. And I'm interested to see, because I got to tell you, when Paramount that spends how much money for their movies? 150 million. 100 million, million plus. 150. Sees this production, you know, which is, and I won't, whatever the budget is. $80,000. Exactly. And the, the level, the quality, the writing, the production, the scope of it, everything, which, by the way, all of us, I'm sure, when you read the script, you thought, how are they going to do this? Um, but after watching Prelude, we all got a little glimpse that you can do this. And I think, you know, the process of putting this all together is going to redefine how Paramount, number one, looks at so-called fan films. I think they're going to look at it as an indie film. They may even, like Trekkies, license it, allow it to go out, do some kind of profit sharing, which will redefine how this works, these so-called fan films. And I think this is the charts, uh, the, the beginning of a revolution in the industry, how things are done. So again, you know, the nice part is, we're all involved in this process. And we're all gonna be the ones who ultimately make the decisions about what we wanna see. Instead of that executive in a boardroom who decides the fate of the shows that we love. So I, 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 I wanna just say one last thing real quick. Um, unlike the fan films which have been really, really grown from just kind of rudimentary productions, have grown in expertise and their skill level, bringing in more and more professionals. And again, there's nothing to put down anything they're doing. They're doing some really wonderful work. Uh, but every production has pushed the, the framework of what is possible. And this production is raising it to a whole new level that I think will challenge all the other Trek productions and so-called fan films, which I think will no longer be a name that is used, to a whole new level as well. But I do, I do think that this is going to redefine how Paramount looks at these films. And it's going to be interesting to see what they do. I'm really curious to see how they respond to this film. I hope it's interesting. Yeah. I hope it's... <clears throat> Thank you very much. You guys over there? Are you a naval captain? <laughs> Are you a naval captain? <laughs> We'd love to. Um, and it, we take all kinds of, uh, I'm a big believer in, again, getting back to that whole inside out thing. I want to know as much as I can about the real stuff. Uh, so yeah, that would be, we have some information, but you can't get enough. Yeah, and you know, uh, a lot of it is about being literate. Um, I've been reading uh, military and specifically naval fiction uh, for uh, 40 years. Uh, uh, there was a great uh, naval author, Charles D. Taylor, who wrote a book called um, Show of Force back in the 70s when I was in college. And it had a profound impact on me, and it's one of the catalysts. And it was about two great admirals, an American and a Russian. Uh, who were fighting a, a cold war that turned hot. And ever since then, I, I've read, the, before, you know, even before Clancy was on the scene, I was reading naval fiction. I'm fascinated by captains, starship captains, naval captains. Uh, I'm, uh, George Patton is one of my, you know, w one of the, my idols, so it always has been. And uh, I've always, why is he the way he is? And, you know, the, you never learn about the, the, I think there's a fascinating correlation between personality and performance as, as, as an admiral. So I think you have to delve into that. And certainly for the role of Garth, and Chris and I have talked about this at length, I mean, you know, the, we, we know from whom God's story very little about this captain other than his resume, right? He was Kirk's hero. His, the victory at Aknar is required reading at the academy. Uh, the, the, the Battle of Axanar, um led to the formation of the Federation or some such event. Uh, that's been retconned. So, so that we don't know anything about him as a person other than what you see 
you know, at, at two points in that episode. So you have to fill that character out. And for me, filling that character out is really about who is he as a person, not a, who is he as a captain. The captain stuff is the easy stuff. Greatest explorer up until, you know, that time, he was the greatest starship captain of all time. He's explored more worlds than anyone else. Eh, that doesn't tell me anything about the person. So you have to really delve into who is he as a person. And this is what, where the writer comes in and Christian helps, is helping a lot. And where then Richard, is my acting coach, helps a lot. And so it's a lot about, it, ultimately it is about the person and the people and less, less so the strategy and tactics. Although this, the, with I, in addition to what Alex saying, because I completely agree with everything he said, uh, it was also wonderful about this model is being able to collaborate. Like JG had complete command of his dialogue and, and really sculpted it to his own perceptions of leadership and really made that character. That's why those, these unique voices all come from each one of these actors who all had a say in their dialogue. And uh, you know, when you've got the wealth of experience we have in them and these four people, you want every bit of it you can get. So they all brought it. And that, that difference you hear when you cut to the, each actor and they sound like a different person, they are a different person, they, that, that richness uh, that as if they were really at that war, it all comes from uh, that kind of thinking, which is go to the real, go to the talent and have them bring forth everything they possibly can. Sean, right behind him. Uh, thank you. How we came up with it, there's several, lots of different stuff that kind of goes into, if you took a pie chart and you started slicing it up, percentage of this, percentage of that, um, here's some of the percentages. I'm not sure which ones are bigger than other slices of the pie yet, but I can list them. Um, military documentary, which Alec and I just love. My first memories of having alone time with my dad, a lot of them are watching the BBC's World at War. Uh, Laurence Olivier narrated it. The, the producers were, got knighthoods. This thing was so good. It's, it's probably the defining military documentary about World War II. And, and, and it defined, I mean, the History Channel today is basically based on World at War. And so that's a huge part of it. Uh, another one was, was the fact that we wanted to show everybody that we had a vision for Star Trek that was that we wanted to blow, kind of blow everybody's mind. Like, look, here's Star Trek as if it's real. I had the good fortune to work with Peter Jackson and the Weta workshop team and the Weta digital team down in New Zealand. And when you work with them, man, you want to talk about inside out. When they were doing Lord of the Rings, they were like, we are making this as if it is the history of the earth, but no one knows it. It's the secret history of ancient humankind. So Alec and I were both very much into that idea of making this, of, of giving that to Star Trek giving it that weight, that legacy, that this is a real thing. These lives are affected. Um, that was JG's line when he added, you know, I, I gave him the line, fragments of starships bouncing off my hull. And then he said, and, and I thought that covered it. I thought that it implied the human beings. And JG said, well, you know, what about fragments of the crews as well? Because that's nasty. You know, that's such a great, really brings it down to that bone marrow. And that's what we were trying to do. And uh, so that's, that's a huge part of it. Another one uh, is my, the director of photography, Milton Santiago, who, when I told him about all this stuff, he said, well, you know, interview shows, and it's true, everybody was like, it's an interview, Chris, it's an interview, it's gonna be so, you know, this really cool CG, and these really great actors, and the great actors are gonna be sitting there talking, blah, 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 blah. You know, gonna, it's gonna be like this. And so I asked the DP, what, you know, what can we do about it? And I, I was gonna move the camera, I was gonna do close, I was gonna do profiles, I was gonna do some certain things, and then he showed me a great documentary called Facing Ali, which is uh, an amazing piece about all the guys that fought Muhammad Ali. They interview all of them. And it's amazing, just amazing stories. If, uh, my father was a boxer uh, before he was an actor, so I, I kind of like tough guys. And it's great to see these guys, hear these guys talk about what the life of a boxer is like. And it made a sporting event into something titanic. And so I wanted to bring that to it too. So a lot of that look uh, is part of that. One more slice of the pie. Most people are going to see this on devices. So that's why, we're, that's why I'm right here. We are close because when you're looking at it on your phone, now also I have beautiful actors. I want to just be as close to them as I possibly could. I was like, Kate Vernon, we need to be closer. Close up. Not close enough. Um, <clears throat> so when you have beautiful people, you want to show them off. And the thing is, most people are going to watch this on some kind of a device. And so I didn't want a medium shot that's gonna become a minuscule little three pixels. I wanna see Gary, I wanna see Richard, I wanna see them all, I wanna see that makeup. We have Oscar winning makeup guys, so that's why I showed you that Vulcaneer. You know, so that's... <laughs> I'm gonna stick it right in the middle of the frame. Thanks. Yeah, 
yeah, and I'll just I'll just add two things to that. The one thing I'll I'll say is I don't know if anyone watched Mash when it was on TV, but there's that one episode of Mash called The Interview. Um, which won an Emmy Award for sc uh, the screenplay. And uh, even when I, when I saw that episode when I was in high school, on, when it was on TV, even as an ignorant high school student, I was like, wow, holy crap, this is... And you remember, it was a very somber, that episode had a pretty somber tone to it. And I was hit by the realism, as Christian said. And that was, the, the, literally, that episode was the spark. That and then that, thinking of that, leads me to thinking of Saving Private Ryan and, and Band of Brothers, which we're both huge fans of, um, which both those informed and all those interviews with all those the, the, those uh, uh, veterans. veterans, thank you, uh, were so powerful. And, and so that, that is what led to the way then, that, that those ideas led to the way that, you know, I, that Christian shot, uh, shot it. And it does all get back to, we, we were basically kind of stuck we wanted to do a trailer. The first trailer I wrote was basically a hundred million dollar production. <laughs> it, was, it was so big. It was, oh, it's beautiful. We'll Cleons do it someday. And cities oh, burning. It's so good. It's so good. But Alex, like, dude, we got to do something we can do. And we sat there. Nothing happened. We went to Starbucks. Didn't work. Went back home. Nothing happened. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Um, I don't remember when it was, but Alec called me. He's like, I got the idea for the trailer. I was like, what? 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 He's like, a military documentary. And I just went nuts. I was so happy because all the, I was like, that's it. Oh my God. It was very exciting because no one had ever done it before, especially in Trek. So. And, and I'll tell you the two things that have to change in Star Trek is the way stories are told because we've been telling the same story. Uh, Star Trek lost its audience because it told the same story over and over and over. So that's one thing that needs to change. And the second thing that needs to change is the way Star Trek is distributed because every, look at TV, everything's changing. The way we tell stories in TV is totally different than the way we told stories 10 years ago. You look at Breaking Bad or Battle Mad Men or, or Battlestar Galactica, or it's all serialized. There are bigger, broader stories. Their characters are darker, uh, more interesting, more complex. It's, it, 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 so that has to change in Star Trek. And, the, and then just the way we distribute things is different. I mean, look at Marvel has revolutionized the way uh, ten pole franchises are being distributed. Marvel's got movies coming out. Two movies a year are coming out. They've got a TV show, and there. And then Marvel brilliantly takes all their tertiary characters that will never be made into a movie or TV show, and they throw them down on Netflix and say, "Here you go. Here's Luke Cage and Daredevil and and Jessica Drew, and and go make uh, Defenders." And they're like, "Oh wow, this is like the, this is p the perfect thing." So, I I was sitting with. Um, one of the top people at CBS, uh, the, the night of our premiere at our after party, and, and uh, he had seen it and he was impressed and I got an audience with the guy and I told him this and he was like, wow, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's the way we need to do Star Trek. So uh, does that mean anything? I don't know, but that's my vision. That's uh, of the way Star Trek is going to be in the, and, uh, in, in the next 10 years. So want to choose someone? Sure. Oh, awesome. Uh, we, no. we talk about it a lot. We, yeah, we talk about it all the time. <laughs> I've Starbucks, already got the, deal, I got the deal memo right Denny's, now. Denny's, <laughs> sushi. Wouldn't it be great if we were getting paid for this? Yeah, that'd be so awesome. We will be at some point. I will tell you, in the next 10 years, we will be. Uh, two hands. <laughs> so that was three hands. Hopefully, I wish it was all up to us, but hopefully. I don't know. It may be just a matter of perception to me. No, I think you're right. Ken, talk to the Star Trek guys up here. Yeah, I, I would just like to say that I, when I entered the what was called the Star Trek family, uh, I was uh, at, at once. Um, honored and intimidated. Intimidated for the long legacy uh, of all the fine quality storytelling over the years. Uh, but I, I was ecstatic that I was a part of this legendary franchise. And uh, uh, just supremely honored. And am honored to carry on the tradition with this that looks uh, and feels and sounds uh, so incredibly uh, professional with 
immense, huge uh, production values. And, and I just get jacked up. Uh, Richard and I were talking about that. Listening to you guys go on and on and on, we're saying, man, I love these guys. I'm just so happy to throw in with you guys. That's, uh, I love it. Yeah, that, what, what these two just said for the past 10 minutes is, uh, is why it looks it's incredible. Secondly, can this, can this be a Star Trek family? Or a... That's it. And I got to say, one of the coolest moments in, in all this past month's year uh, of making this uh, has been today. And that, because we, listen, the, we, we're all here, the entire, you know, the six cast members are here, uh, Christian's here, um, you know, Terry and Diana are here. We're, we've got the crew here, you know, a portion of the crew, but a big part of it here for the first time. We've never done this before. And uh, at George, uh, thanks to George, the promoter, for bringing us and, and saying we want to make Axanar the centerpiece of this convention. That was awesome. But uh, we were over taking photographs, the group photos. Some of you got group photos with us. And uh, a couple of you, I, f I think it was JG and Tony. Tony came up to me and said, you know, Tony says, we need to do this again. Um, and I know JG was like, dude, this is fun. Let's get, you know, we all need to go to Dragon Con. And um, so the, the, I think the answer to your question is uh, we are a Star Trek family. We may not be the Star Trek family, but we're developing our own family here that, yes, we all love one day to be part of the greater CBS Star Trek family. Um, that would be nice. Um, but I think we're developing, I am content right now to develop our own identity with these amazing and I say these and these who you saw on the screen and all the credits because it just goes deeper than, than just our cast. Amazing people. Two things I'll say real quick are when David Gerald, the writer of The Trouble with Tribbles, read the script for the first time, he, he said, uh, after, he told me it was, he said it was good. He goes, this is real good. And then he said, this is Star Trek. So David Gerald says that to you. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, I like real quick, Tony Todd's not here. I wish he was, but I, let's give Tony Todd a hand, please. Uh, his amazing presence and work. Yeah. All right, let's get some more questions. Uh, <laughs> yes, over here. Do you mean is shore leave the convention? The, sh the convention shore leave? Oh yeah, that that uh, that was one of the first Star Trek conventions I ever went to, like 25 years ago. Me too. We will follow up with them for sure. Thank you, thank you. Yes, being the I I don't even have to look at the panel, and I can tell you I'm the only one up here who's played Star Trek online. <laughs> uh, geek alert! <laughs> I actually played it for one month when it first came out. Uh, right before Battlefield 3 came out, and I'm a huge Battlefield player and have been for eight years, so that, that took its place. But I played Star Trek Online for a month, and it was fun. It was a fun game. I don't play many games, but uh, that, it was a fun game. I know Thomas Marone, who does all our patches, all the wonderful patches you see uh, uh, on our table out there, is one of the uh, designers for Star Trek Online. So we're tied in, you know, we, we talk frequently about Star Trek Online. Um, they're, uh, uh, they're, and we're also on the Priority One podcast a, a, a lot, which is the official podcast of, of Star Trek Online or the unofficial podcast, whatever. Uh, so we're tapped into those guys. I, I don't think there's a lot of, um, other than it's, hey, Star Trek geeks, and let's talk about Star Trek together. There's not a lot out of Star Trek Online, which takes place, you know, what, 150 years later or, or whatever in the timeline, and it's 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 not really relevant. I. Believe me, I, I pitched them, how about we get the USS Ares as one of your ships? You know, and that was like, they were like, yeah, I can't do that. So, thank you for, happy to chat with you about that at our table if you want to chat more about that. Maybe Kate, you want to talk about what, what you think about women in leadership? Women, in, women leadership. in leadership. Because for one, I for one wish the whole Congress was women and not we men. We need more women in leadership. Yeah. And I don't, I don't say that I don't say that in a man-hating way at all. It's just out of balance. That's all. We're way out of balance. So to create more balance, which is what our entire planet needs, we need more 
female voices. We don't, it's just too separate right now. And too masculine. Too masculine and too war-oriented, power-dominated, and... You and say that like it's a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> Look around. <laughs> We're in trouble, folks. So, you know, it, Sex and race, it doesn't matter what you are, where you're from, what you look like, what your preference is. It it's about the heart. That's what's going to save us. That's what's going to keep us alive. That's what's going to keep our planet alive. It's the heart. And connecting to people and remembering we're all human. We all come from the same place. We all breathe the same air. And, and we need more balance in this world. And I'd, I'd like to begin that balance by getting JG another scotch. <laughs> Could somebody get? Thank you. All right, gotta take care of my man. A couple more questions and we're gonna have to, we have to leave before we bore you all to death. Uh, so, uh, okay, you in the, Batman? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. Yeah, because thank you very much. A lot for of people have been asking that question. No, then, and the no, question it's not. was, Plans. are we going to continue the the documentary style in the full length feature? No, that's no. The, it, the full length feature is going to be an action, war, romantic. <laughs> it's going to be a story. Comedy. Like uh, it's going to be a movie. Where's it's the not romance? Be, hmm? There's a romance. Yeah. Yes, there is. You got to have romance. I'm Spanish think, and French, so I'm, I'm all into romance. I think I read a, uh, I read a draft where uh, Saval gets jiggy with it. <laughs> Am I right? Am we're going to have some... <laughs> we're going to have some, some cling... I want some Klingon intimacy. I want, like, that, that... Right? Wouldn't that be cool? What do Klingons do when they're alone and they're into it? I want to know. I want to show that. Okay, two oh Klingons boy. are there alone. <laughs> Richard Hatch. The secrets of Richard Hatch's Klingon. It ain't over until it's over. Yeah, yeah, it's got to have romance. Star Trek is very romantic. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> crickets, crickets on that one. No, so thank you very much. No, as much as I love Prelude and as much as I love military documentary, I don't think we could sustain that over two hours. So, no, it's going to be a movie movie. However, however... A uh, question that was previously asked to us, which none of you have picked up on yet, was... Hey, and looking at your title credits, it says The Four Years' War, Part 3. <laughs> what about Parts 1, 2, and 4? I, I was hoping you would never say anything about that. But <laughs> if, we get, if we're fortunate and if our um, amazing team online, can, uh, headed by Terry McIntosh and the rest of the gang, continues to raise enough funds, we'd love to do more things like it. It really comes down to resources. Yeah, absolutely, because we'd all love to be doing this for a long time. Uh, question, are there, yes, sir? Uh, one question related to the explain uh, There's a reason why uh, we are not using as plain notes as the two most experienced plain notes in the group, like uh, JG and... Right, so, the, yes, the question being, JG and, and Tony Todd were Klingons in, uh, in Star Trek. Why are they not Klingons now? And uh, I'll, I'll start off and I'll let JG and say, I didn't want to see J.G. as a Klingon. I've seen him as a Klingon. I love, Deep Space Nine's my favorite Star Trek. I love Martok. I think J.G. was absolutely brilliant and, and just gave so much depth to that character. I, I loved it. I, so I want to see him without the makeup. I just, I, he's a great actor in, 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 in anything he's in. Um, and I didn't want, I, I, we're trying not to cast people we know in Star Trek the same way. It was like with Richard, it was like, you know, listen, I know Richard, I've known him for 20 years. He's, he's either Apollo or Tom Zarek to me. And I was like, but what would he look like if he was a Klingon? And we see he looks amazing as a Klingon. So hopefully our, insti our instincts were correct. Um, and it's the same, the reverse. So, so it's like Harry Kim. I don't want to see Garrett Wong as as Harry Kim. I know he's Harry Kim in Voyager. If you see Garrett now, 10 years later, he still looks like Harry Kim, okay? I don't want to see that in, in my Star Trek. I, I want to see him as a Klingon. I want to see him something. And so the reverse is true too. The Klingons, I want to, you know, I guess you, you can love Martok and, 
and Kern all you want. You can't, it's hard to argue with the way JG and Tony Todd look as human beings in Prelude. JG, your thoughts? Yeah, it's, it's really tough to, it would have been tough for me to do a, I, I had the same question. I said, why, why, why am I not Karn? Can I be Karn? I'll pay you. <laughs> but when I thought about it, and you asking really makes me crystallize those thoughts. I, I, don't, I don't think I could have done it because I, Martok I got to work on for five years or four years and uh, be hard to get out of that mode and I wouldn't even want to try. I played a Klingon in, on uh, Gods and Men and I, I, as much as I think the other people did wonderful jobs, I hated myself. You know, I just didn't care for it. It was garbage. What he did, what Richard did as a Klingon, and this is, uh, has immense potential, and I can't wait to see it. And I really do feel like this is a, an interesting crew, almost like the crew in Galaxy Quest, you know? Uh, those guys are unforgettable. And... I know that, you know, we, we're not going to be doing the same kind of a thing, but the center section of that film is a massive Star Trek-like adventure. And uh, it's wonderful. Sucked me right in. And, and the same thing's true of this. These guys are wonderful together. The chemistry that they created among the cast. And just think if Tony Todd was sitting here. You know, his immense presence would, would, would add tremendously to this dial, to this multi-dialogue, um, this conversation, and it changes the temperature in the entire room, but it doesn't change the chemistry of this whole group because it's very strong, and with Tony only makes it stronger. Um, I, I, I actually can't wait, and my hopes are that we can actually do this. Tremendous hopes have been raised, and I, mine are right there. I don't I'm not, I don't care about adding to my resume at this point. I don't care. I want to, I want to do things with my friends that are exciting and build that family like a resident theater company that you share intense time with. And then you take a break and then you intense, more, more intense time. That's what I'm looking forward to, to spending the, the rest of my career. Um, and I can't wait for it to happen. My fingers are crossed. Now, we're in Texas. Are there any, like, wildcat oil drillers out there or s executives on the boards of major oil companies? Yeah. Who, yeah. And? <laughs> any other questions? Yes, all the way in the back up. Uh, uh, dude, if I have another milk, Catherine, I'm, uh, uh, there better be... S now watch your step, darling. You got it. All right. We'll come to you. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. That's frightening. I don't know how you do Those are cool boots. Especially Oh, my God. Thank you, sir. Oh, uh, okay, so I'm going to ask that question, then we're going to have to go. And if you want to ask any other questions, you can ask us at uh, our booth, uh, where we'd be happy to chat. Um, you know, the, the, I, we have a, a future for Axonar. The future for Axonar is we're going to make Axonar. Um, now, we are also, as part of this Kickstarter, uh, renting a uh, massive 19,000 square foot warehouse for the next year um, at an insanely cheap rate for LA. For LA. Uh, so we will have the opportunity to do other things. Yes, I would like, love to be able to uh, be so successful at this that we can go on making more and more Star Trek. Uh, and that uh, is a factor of how many donors we have and are you willing to pay on a regular basis to see great Star Trek. And uh, we love our donors and you're amazing, those of you who have donated. And those of you who have not donated, I'm sure you will and we will be amazing too. Please do, please. 
And uh, we, we, yes, uh, we'd love to tell other stories. We'd love to tell the other three parts of the Four Years War documentary. We'd love to tell the story of, uh, you know, maybe Robert April in the early years on the Enterprise, or uh, maybe other uh, adventures uh, in the Four Years War time frame. Or the, the adventures of uh, Ambassador Saval during Pond Far. <laughs> We'll, 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 we'll sell that to the Playboy channel <laughs> in our media empire. So anyway, so please, um, we're here all the uh, day tomorrow, so please come by and say hi, get their autographs, um, uh, and uh, thank you so much for your uh, support and for your enthusiasm and your passion. This is, uh, this is going to keep us alive and, sh and, and keep us moving forward, and it really is what Star Trek's all about. So. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. This gentleman, I, he really sealed the deal. First of all, I've told many people already, just in talking at the table and whatnot, that I think that um, Alec has done an amazing thing in getting that, this project to this point. This point is pure professionalism, and it comes from putting a real professional at the top of, where are you going? I, I finally get to talk. And, <laughs> Oh, drinking. Bring me, bring me a scotch, will you? Thing, if you can get back here, or send somebody. Send one of your people with a scotch for me. We know who you are, Catherine. Yes. Okay. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Just get out of the rooms. We all take scotches, except Kate. She takes a glass of white wine. No, I'm just going to stick with water. She's so much fun after a glass of white wine. Is the... Yeah. Yeah, she says that, but... Oh, my God. oh, fine. <laughs> back to Chi. I'm sorry. He's trying to talk. Not only did I have back somebody to you, leave Gigi. when I finally get to speak, but we, the the con the conversation just d departs. You are on the part about me. how great, what a great producer I am. Yes. Oh, that's right. <laughs> he put a uh, he, he put a real professional in the in the at the head of every department. Makes a huge difference because the first thing I did was outside of. Um, Hollywood was a, a fan-based film called Gods and Men. Had a lot of people in it. Had a lot of, you know, uh, Tim Russ and, and uh, Walter Koenig and Nichelle Nichols and a lot of good people. Gary Graham and Garrett Wong. Um, Gary, Gary Graham. Telegram for Gary Graham. Lance Hart. Uh, <laughs> it was that... Well, I don't want to talk about that experience because it doesn't compare with this. That was interesting and fun, but uh, it, it, this is a real Hollywood movie, and it's a, it's a great uh, honor to be part of it. And uh, I just want to see it get done. I, it, we have a, a Kickstarter going, and as you said t this morning, or no, Tony just said it. Uh, Tony taught in his, that the whole world of producing films in Hollywood has changed with crowdfunding for the most part. We can do this and we can do it professionally. We can do it right. And you are, Alec, it's just amazing. The first great thing you did was get together with this guy. I, I, I think the world of you, uh, before tonight, I thought the world of you, Christian. Uh, he's really something. And I said it yesterday, he comes from the world of visual arts uh, as he's done on several films with major, major Oscar winning uh, directors, and he brings a, a visual aspect to his directing, which is phenomenal. But that combined with his appreciation for an actor's art is 
unique. You never see that. You never find that in a director, and it's, uh, that's a miracle. And these guys are, you know, phenomenal, uh, except for Gary. These guys are, uh, are at, no, you've done nothing. You've, <laughs> you've done nothing to antagonate me, Gary, and antagonize me, and I'm sorry. Um, you just, you're the furthest target away right now. So these guys can reach me. Well, uh, I want to make sure we get, a, a get all of you uh, to ask questions. So who has a question in the audience for any of these fine cast? Yes, sir. Um, what is a fan film? A fan film is a film made by fans, okay? There are a lot of fans that are making J.J. Abrams Star Trek. A lot of the guys in that production are big fans of Star Trek. Does that mean it's a fan film? No. Well, so what's a fan film? A fan film is typically low budget. It's n not professionals. It doesn't have the, a, a lot, and I'm not speaking ill of it because many of you know I, I, I work uh, as a producer on Star Trek Phase Two, a true fan film, That's, uh, which is a labor of love, right? Um, this isn't a fan film because we have professionals in front and behind of the camera. And everything we do, we try and do and, and, at a very professional level. And when you have great actors, if you want to make them happy, you need to have a great director, you need to have great craft services, great makeup, great customers, great, right? So you wind up with a, as I always say, I, and I think I, I told JG this, uh, my dad was a headhunter in New York, and he always said A players hire A players, and B players hire C players. And so my job is to hire six great A players. I think I'm an A player. I hire people that are smarter than me, right? So I got Christian. He was the first guy that was on board on, on this. And then and every person I hire, whether it's a line producer or a customer or a makeup artist or whoever, I'm going out there and hiring the best I can possibly get. And I'm pretty good at that. And if they're an A player, they go out and hire six A players themselves. So all of a sudden, you got 42 A players making a film, and this is what you get. And it's... it's you. I, I'm not offended when people say, oh, that's a fan film, fine, whatever. I, I let the fans determine what this is. Personally, I think, and I think most of the people have given money to us now and have seen this, think this is a professional, we call it independent Star Trek filmmaking. That's what we call it. Um, but call it whatever you want. I, I, I think it, the work speaks for itself. I, I'm not offended when people call it whatever. Next, next question. Yeah, we do not fear the Klingon Empire. Um, so, uh, actually, Rob Burnett, who is the writer director of Free Enterprise and has produced all the Star Trek Blu-rays, uh, was supposed to be here uh, doing what I'm doing right now, but uh, sadly. He was busy finishing off season seven of the Star Trek Blu-rays and could not get away. So he is an important member of our team because he's our editor and, uh, and our built-in comedy as well. So um, anyway, so uh, Christian uh, was late to the panel yesterday. She flew in late. Um, who you know I, I speak uh, so uh, uh, well of because of the Red Star. Christian, um, tell us, what was it like to direct this amazing cast? It's, um, wow, what was it like? It was fantastic and phenomenal. And it's fun. It was really, really fun. Each and every one of them being so different, each and every one of them being uh, so talented, each and every one of them bringing stuff to it that you couldn't possibly have asked for. <clears throat> um, it was like that. <laughs> and then, let me start over there with Gary Graham. Maybe you could pass the, the mic down. To, uh, there's a, Kate, you got a mic right there? Okay. You, what was it like being directed by Christian? 
It was kind of like this and a little like that, and then it was some of that. This, not that, sometimes that. <laughs> he, he, uh, God, I don't know. Uh, Christian, you know, the best thing about a, a good director is when they, uh, they let you do your thing and they stay out of your way. That's what we love to think, um, and it doesn't always work out that way, but uh, Christian was uh, very much an advocate, an actor's advocate while we're working. You always got the sense that you were supported, and, and he was, wherever you fell, uh, he'd catch you. He's the, he's the safety net underneath the uh, high wire act at the circus. He, he's, the, uh, he's the fuel that, that, that primes, primes the pump and just pulls it out of you uh, like a sadistic dentist. <laughs> Uh, all without a Novocaine and no, yeah, there you go. So that's my story I'm sticking to. Uh, <laughs> oh, where do, uh, do we need drinks again? We, oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yes. yeah who, was, who was in charge of that yesterday? You got to give him a hand for that. That, that was like amazing. Um, uh, Richard, uh, what was it like to work in Klingon makeup? You have some very interesting thoughts about that. Uh, go ahead, tell well, us. Um, hmm. You hear all the time actors say, you know, that when they when they finally see themselves in the mirror after, you know, at the end of the makeup session, it helps them inhabit the role. Well, so, I, I got uh, that, that's true. But I, I actually there was a movie with um, God, who was the guy in Cool Hand Luke? Paul Newman. No, the other guy. The famous character actor that was in. No, 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 no. The guy that. Strother Martin. So there was a movie called Psst about a guy turning into a snake. And had I known, honestly, to, to work with Strother Martin would have been great. Um, but it was going to be like 10 hours in makeup to be able to go through that transition. And I don't know about you, but putting on prosthetics going through that process is a nightmare for actors, okay? So when they came to me with the Klingon thing, uh, I, first of all, we, most of us, or many of us, have cl cliche ideas of what a Klingon is, you know? And I, uh, I thought, I, I don't know if this is a right fit for me, but as we began to talk about this, and we went into the Kutsumoto, Last of the Samurai, went into some of these other, you know, ideas and concepts about him, I started to get interested and I have to tell you, the more I kind of dialogued with these guys, and really, and this was an amazing experience to collaborate with these two guys, whose vision, the scope of their vision, is so absolutely amazing that they pull you into what they're doing. You it excites you, it challenges you, and it, it makes you want to step into this incredible experience that they're putting together. And I got to tell you, it, it didn't even matter. I wasn't, the minute I kind of got hold of who this guy was, I was really, really uh, excited to play him. And then, uh, and then the makeup experience, I must say, was a hell of a lot less painful than I thought it would be. The, the hardest part was this mold they put on your face, and it kind of sits there and gets hot, and you can't breathe. And just before I passed out, they took it off. And thank God, it's like having a waffle glued I'm, to your yeah. face. So, so anyway, all I want to say is, I don't think for any other character would I have put on four hours of makeup. Thanks and, again, Richard. And Thanks it was for extraordinary for me. I love this guy. Karn is such an interesting man. You're the most handsome Klingon. I mean... I got to add to this. Too. Oh, he JG. Is. I mean... <laughs> no, wait, 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 wait. Wait, wait. Martok, come back here. No, no. I, I, had a th I had a thing for you, okay? It's Martok. I did. Seriously, I had fantasies about you every night. Uh, uh, JG's like, four hours of makeup. I did that every day for nine years. Can I tell you? I, I never felt sexy in my life. And I don't know if any other woman ever found me sexy. But I swear to God. Hello. Wearing that... Out no, I'm telling you the truth. Wearing that Klingon outfit and walking down that... that Hollywood Boulevard. 
Well, that's how you two met. That's anyway, right. I do that every night at 3 o'clock yeah. now. I just put on the outfit and play with myself. It's fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, JG, can, can you commiserate? No, or, or, or do you, the building, man. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to Facebook about that right now. Talking about an accident. This prima donna of a hatch talking about four hours of makeup. I'm just talking about Axanar. Of course. Liar. Aren't we all talking about Axanar? <laughs> I didn't say ever. Oh. Um, Kate. Yeah. Trouble. I, I don't think he, if you weren't here for this morning for the Battlestar Galactica panel, Kate. I asked one question and Kate took a half hour to, to answer it. And it was a half hour of the most fascinating panel you'll, you'll ever see. So hopefully George is gonna make it available on camera. It was really uh, wonderful, uh, her story about how she got into uh, Battlestar Galactica. So um, tell us a little bit about your working with Christian as a director and just getting into Axnar because you really, just to tell you a quick story, how if you haven't heard it before, the reason Kate is in Axanar is because a year ago, Christian and I were at WonderCon, and we stopped by Richard Hatch's table, since Richard and I are friends, we were just bullshitting, and Christian wanders over, right next is, is Kate, and Christian wanders over, and he's chatting with Kate for about 15 minutes while I'm chatting with Richard, and afterwards, I chatted, I know her assistant, and we started, I wandered over, and we start chatting together, and we both left uh, Kate's table, and we look at each other and, and we're like, we have got to find a role for Kate Vernon in Axanar. It was, and, and she didn't find out about this until literally a year, almost a year later, when we finally said, hey, Kate, we're, we My finally My ears were up. burning for a year, though. <laughs> I couldn't figure so out So Linda why. told you about us, we met it, and tell, and tell us about what your thoughts about when we pitched Axanar to you. Well, I was incredibly flattered, no one's, um, written apart for me before and can you hear me yes. okay um and i was intimidated because i thought oh my god a captain you know um years and years when when um nypd blue was on and uh all these detective shows i'd go and i'd audition for a policewoman or a detective and i always thought i had to act really tough and macho like a dude, like a cop or whatever, and I never felt truthful. And I have to say, Mary McDonald was a real inspiration for me because she never put on a tough persona to play a leader. She played herself and she played a truth. And that was a beautiful lesson for me, Finney, because I never booked any of those NYPD jobs <laughs> because I tried too hard and I was working from the outside in and that never works for me. So, um, uh, being, it, it was, <laughs> but you're British, <laughs> Are you, you think, I, aren't you? <laughs> He's still mad at me. Um, um, so being incredibly flattered and uh, really nervous um, and curious, I of course took the meeting and. Um, just love these guys. They're very intelligent. They know what they want. And they were very clear at, at about explaining um, what it is they wanted and did their best to make me feel comfortable. And working with Christian was great because he, he just would dial... So I told him, he goes, what's, what's the worst thing a director can do to an actor? And I said, over talk. If you over talk me, I'm going to go blank and it's going to take hours to get me to come back. Because... I go. If you're going to yap at me and give me way too much information, then I'm a saturated. I'm just saturated. And it's too much information. And it's very hard for me to then lose it, squeeze it all out to get to the essence. So I said to him, just dial me a little bit, just a little bit, if you want something. But don't come on heavy handed or you'll lose me. And he did beautiful, just beautiful job. He just dialed me a little this way and a little that way. And if that allowed me to find it, as opposed to instant coffee. And uh, so I, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> but, but Kate, that's also because, listen, to your credit, that's not, Kate's being too modest. It's like, I, it's because she's such an amazing actress. And, and I'm going to to pass the mic to Christian. Christian, tell us about directing Kate. <clears throat> it was so fun. Well, having gotten that note from Kate, <laughs> 
<laughs> we got that note from Kate. <laughs> Look at you. It's true, we did kind of skip John. Hey. No, no, we're going back. All right, we're going back to you, John. We're still on me. Fine. <laughs> this reminds me of how Martok got treated by the Klingon High Council that time. <clears throat> um, having got that note, it was awesome because I found myself so enamored with each different way Kate would play each line that at one point, not only did I not say much, I was basically just saying, okay, one more time. Okay, again. A little bit different. I don't know. Just say it. You, you just do what you're doing. No. <laughs> it was. It was fun. It was really fun to have Kate Vernon just sitting there being a captain. And you want to talk about working from the inside out or the outside in. When actors talk about that, does anybody have any clue what that is? I don't want to tell you stuff you already know. But um, working from the outside in is basically kind of faking it. You're just kind of like, okay, I'm a captain, so I'm, I'm that. It's outside. Inside out is you know what this captain's been through. You have ideas of how they trained. You have these, this deep, rich kind of, it's coming from inside. It's coming from truth. You, you've had experiences in your life, and you're applying those experiences to the way you're saying each line. And it, I can't believe they didn't book you to play more cops. <laughs> More, you know, you know what? You're like more like mayor material. You're a commissioner. You're not a detective. You know that's what's great about what I found. You're like more up there, like DA, mayor, yeah. Mayor Vernon. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No. Let's, who, do we, who wants to talk to J, me to ask JG a question now? Shall we go to JG now? You know, no, no. I I used to think the world of Christian. <laughs> But it's like that's the that's the best thing. That's the best comment when they say, "You know, you're too good for this role. <laughs> you need something bigger. When we get something bigger, we'll come back to you immediately." <laughs> I had somebody say to me, "You, John, you're like a force of nature." Thank you. Never heard from them again. Unfortunately, we don't need a hurricane in this. Uh, uh, yeah, but <laughs> I don't really mean this about Christian Gossett. Marketing, he's in charge of communicating with all the donors on a daily basis, of which he does an amazing job of. And so uh, and he runs the Axonar Donors Group, which is a special Facebook group. You have got to be a donor uh, in order to get into that, in, into that. So even if you donate, you know, 10 bucks, you're in. And uh, we have a lot of great people there. And it's a, every day we're talking about Axonar and giving you more information. So uh, that's one thing. Okay, I haven't seen Tony yet, so he'll have to catch it at another time. Because I don't think he's here. Is he here? Very good. Lights, camera, action. The first goal was create a class of ship that could spring Starfleet back into action, back into battle. We had to leapfrog Klingon technology. It was called the Ares class. It was exactly what we needed. We had over a dozen member worlds working on it. It was the first pure warship that Starfleet had ever built. As for Vulcans, Though we limited our contribution to propulsion, environmental, and defensive technologies, there were many who wanted us to end our participation in the war altogether. A Vulcan's gonna do what a Vulcan's gonna do. But the Andorians, they were happy to supply us the phasers. Starting 2244.1, near the planet Cygnus III, there will always be detractors who think you're taking the initiative to assume that you're, you're rushing the offensive. I disagreed. The leadership of Admiral Ramirez is a welcome change, but his grand plan has yet to be tested in battle. We had the ships, and we had a core of battle-tested commanders. It was time to take the initiative. Well, that was Ramirez's first roll of the dice. And they landed exactly the way we wanted them to, the way we needed them to. The code name was Operation Pegasus. Pegasus was the first test of the Ares class against the ship it was designed to defeat, the D6. 
The Ares class looked good in simulations, real good. But data can only take you so far. The only true test for a combat vessel is combat. The new Federation ships were unexpected. And then there was Garth. <laughs> That mad Isarian son of a bitch. That was his day. Garth likes to play down his contribution. Don't you believe it? What he did that day, no captain had ever done. We got lucky. It was Sonya's maneuver that gave me the opening. Sonya pulled a feint to starboard. Garth just went for it. It was like a Klingon maneuver. It was a new ship. They said she was tough. I want to see what she could take. After the Battle of Cygnus III, our ship captain started giving the Federation its due as a worthy adversary. And for the first time, we took notice of Garth of Izar. Oh. By the way, we, uh, the credits are, you know, the credits are really important, and I'll tell you why. Because all of these, almost all of these people, worked for free, and they gave their, you know, their their hearts and their souls to this project. And we have two Academy Award winners here of, of note: Frank Serafine, who was the original sound effects editor on Star Trek: The Motion Picture. He was our sound editor, um, and uh, Kevin Haney, who did Richard Hatch's Klingon makeup, uh, and uh, was uh, is another Academy Award winner. Include, and then we also had Brad Look, who did Gary. Uh, Graham's original makeup on Enterprise came back in it. So we had some amazing, amazing people, and I can tell you stories about every one of them. Also, our composer, Alex Bornstein, who did the amazing music in, in this. Uh, he is a young guy, but he will one day, I guarantee you, win an Academy Award. So now, I want to introduce to you uh, the cast uh, of Star Trek Axnar, and uh, we're going to start with my good friend, Richard Hatch. Girls pay money for that. <laughs> um, the wonderful and talented Kate Vernon. <laughs> she doesn't kiss me. Uh, the, uh, the, the gentleman who has, is tied with Jeffrey Combs for playing the most characters in Star Trek ever, the wonderful John Hertzler. <laughs> and, uh, and your favorite Vulcan ambassador, uh, Gary Graham. And last but not least, uh, my very, very good friend and our director, Christian Gossett. So, um, does someone say kapla? Hello, everybody. This is Ming Chen. Hi, I'm Mike Zapsik from AMC's Comic Book Man. And you are watching AFK, the AFK show, our favorite show on the planet. One of. One of. One of. One of. So you're, you're, you're watching the right show. Keep watching and keep watching. And keep watching. And keep watching. Don't stop. <laughs>
chat a little bit, and then uh, and then you guys can ask questions if you uh, if you have them. So uh, just a few bookkeeping notes. First thing I almost forgot to mention yesterday is uh, we have a Kickstarter going right now. So uh, if you like what you see on the screen here, uh, this is really our Kickstarter video. <laughs> it's basically saying this is what we're doing. Help us fund the full-length movie. This is a 20-minute short you're about to see. Uh, and uh, the full-length movie is 90 minutes. Uh, and we've been working on it, you know, hard for uh, a while now. And it will, uh, the Kickstarter right now is up to $210,000, uh, which is exciting. We need $650,000 uh, to produce the whole film. So we don't expect to get it all in the first Kickstarter, but hopefully we're going to get about half of it, which will allow us to build all the sets and get a sound stage for a year and uh, really do a lot of great stuff. Uh-oh. Yes, you don't want me throwing triples at you. <laughs> Turn your phones off. Because I am the guy in the movie theater that when your phone goes off, I turn around and say something to you. So, so don't turn off all your phones. Um, and uh, so if you, how many people gave in our first Kickstarter, the Prelude to Axe in our Kickstarter? Thank you, thank you. And how many have given in our second Kickstarter already? Yes, thank you again. Um, and the rest of you I'm sure will give after you're wowed by this uh, production. Um, please afterwards, uh, Kate Vernon, Richard Hatch, J.G. Hertzler, Gary Graham are out here signing autographs. Tony Todd will be leaving, as I said. So please stop by and buy an autograph from them. Um, stop by the Axonar table. We have all sorts of swag there that you can buy. 100% of all the money spent at the Axonar table goes towards the production. Um, so, and Christian Gossett, our director, is here too, uh, if you're a fan of the Red Star. How many people are a fan of the Red Star graphic novel series? Oh, that, see? Christian, this is why you need to be the graphic novels. No one here in Houston knows about the Red Star. The Red Star is absolutely one of the greatest graphic novels of all time. My good friend Christian Gossett wrote and drew it. It is amazing. It's being reprinted by IDW now. So uh, you all need to go check that out. Uh, Christian will be signing autographs, as I will, for free at, at our booth. So check us out. Uh, Terry, how are we doing? I think we're good. We think we're good? OK. Uh, I'm just, just going to wait one minute until uh, who can I get to run out? Uh, I just need to uh, just run out and see if Tony, tell Tony we're about to start. Okay, he really would like to see that. Yeah, I know he wants to see this, and he has to see on the big screen. I'm good. You think we should wait for Tony Todd or just? Yeah. Okay. All right. Who well, has a good joke? Just kill some time. No. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, let just give you a little, uh, our schedule. Um, how many people go to Dragon Con who are here? Yeah, okay, we're going to be at Dragon Con. There's going to be the East Coast premiere of uh, Prelude to Axonar. We'll be at Dragon Con. And I'll tell you something no one else knows yet. This has not been released on our website yet. But we've just signed another star uh, for Axonar. And Garrett Wang. <laughs> Garrett is going to play a Klingon. So you do not have to see Harry Kim. Uh, but, uh, and this Klingon will be an ensign and will never get promoted. Uh, no, he's playing, uh, he, uh, Gar uh, Garrett and I met in Vegas last week, um, we, uh, and I tell you what, I'll just tell you until we find out about Tony real quick, uh, we were at FedCon in Germany where we had the premiere of the trailer, and Garrett was there on stage, and uh, I was there with my, uh, uh, my girlfriend Diana, who's in the audience, where's Diana? There she is, in the, look in the, in, at the Axonar costume designed by Christian Gossett, everyone has seen that? And, uh, and, we, and I saw Garrett on stage, and he has, he's so engaging and, and gregarious and outgoing, and I said, God, that's the kind of person we need in Axonar. And I, so for the past three months, I've been stalking him relentlessly on Twitter and Facebook and Skype, Twitter, Facebook, Skype, email. And, and finally, uh, we, got, we hunted him down at a con a couple weeks ago, and, and uh, our, our two staff photographers cornered him and said, you know, hey, Axonar. And he knew about us, and he said, yeah, if I can play a Klingon. He says, I've always wanted to play a Klingon. So that got back to me. I was like, fine, Klingon, Klingon it is. And uh, we met in Vegas last week, and uh, I hadn't seen, he, hadn't even, he hadn't seen the full-length prelude that you are all about to see. So I showed it to him on my phone, and he was like, oh, this is awesome. I'm in. And we talked about which role he's going to play. And, uh, you know, now we just 
have to write them into the script. So, uh, but it's very exciting. And that is not the last casting. I will tell you that's not the last exciting casting you will hear uh, over the course of the next uh, many months um, because uh, there are many more roles. We haven't cast, everyone you see in Prelude will be in Axanar. All these characters are part of the, part of the script. Um, and the other, uh, and there are other characters. You haven't seen any of the, Air, the USS Ares crew yet. We're casting all of those characters here in the next couple months. Uh, and so they'll, if, uh, you can always check out our Facebook pages where the news comes out. Of course, if you're a donor, you get all the news in advance and you get all these tasty morsels and video and photos and, and you get to harass Terry. Terry McIntosh, uh, if you're a donor, you know Terry McIntosh dressed as a Jaffa. Uh, Terry is uh, one of our producers and our director